DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Julia Marie Hogan, who is a licensed clinical professional counselor in Chicago. In addition to her work as a psychotherapist, she leads workshops and writes on topics related to self-care, relationships, and mental health. She's passionate about empowering individuals to be their most authentic selves. With Julie Marie Hogan, we go inside the pages of It's Okay to Start With You, published by Our Sunday Visitor. Julia, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Chris. I love this book. I love it so much because a a very wise 90-year-old Monsignor once said to me, Chris, What you have to do is remember the airplane rule. You have to put the mask over yourself first before you can help anyone else. And I don't think there has been a work that has made it easier to learn how to do that than what you brought forward. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you for your kind words. I love that you use the oxygen mask analogy. I was just talking to someone else on a different podcast and I brought that up and we were talking about how it is just such a simple but just it really hits home I think when it comes to self-care about what it really is and what the value is in it. Um, So I love that analogy. I think it's something that we almost have to train ourselves properly to do. I think Mm -hmm. we try a lot of things to help ourselves, but they're not always constructive things, or they're in many cases, it can be downright harmful or even dangerous, because we're trying to fix something inside of ourselves, and we don't know how to do it. Don't you think, Julia? I think so. I think that, you know, self-care is a really popular term today. I have a Google alert set up for the word self-care, so any articles that are published for the day, I get an email with them. And a lot of them promote a very surface level form of self care. So something like, oh, wa- you know, watch your favorite TV show, or go and get a manicure, go get a massage. And I don't think those things are necessarily harmful in and of themselves. But it's just a temporary fix. And so what I talk in my book about is what authentic self care is. So what is what does it mean to be rooted in your knowledge of God's love for you and to use that as your motivation for taking care of yourself. And it's actually a discipline, Chris. It's not something that is self-indulgent or lazy or, you know, trying to get out of life's responsibilities. It it can be hard at times to practice self-care. I mean, for example, think about, you know, getting enough sleep. I, I know myself, I'm tempted to get as much done as I possibly can. And going to sleep sometimes feels like, oh, no, I, I didn't get everything done that I wanted to do today, right? It's such an unproductive use of time, isn't it? Just to lay yeah. there and sleep. Right, totally, uh, right? It's not like your body needs to rest and recharge and store memories and clean your brain and no. all of that. That doesn't need to happen. <laughs> no. But it does, doesn't it? I yeah, mean, it, it it's absolutely essential. And it's like the one thing that, uh, what is it? it? The Benedictines long ago, I had this wonderful, this practice of the rhythm of the day. So mm-hmm. and by the time the sun went down, that's when everything started to mellow down. But since in a very real way, because of the light bulb and our ability in the television and everything else, somehow we are pushed to stay up so much later, aren't we? I think so. And I think just because we're constantly connected to, you know, through the internet and social media that it's really hard to shut down from that, I think, and to kind of have like a closing time sort of, you know, we're okay, we're, I'm done with this for the day, I need to take a break from it. And it can be hard to break yourself of that connectivity. And I think that also goes back to what I was saying about self-care being a discipline. You know, it's it's hard to turn off all those distractions. It's hard to avoid screen time before you go to bed. Uh, It's hard to go to bed on time and get those seven to eight hours of sleep. But when you do, you experience all those uh, benefits of self-care, right? You're a better person. Um, Your memory is better. Your energy levels are better. Your body metabolizes better. And you just feel better. But it takes that discipline of making the commitment to get enough sleep and make that happen to feel the benefits of that. So it's far from self-indulgent, right? And far from selfish. Mm -hmm. I think where the real key to this is, is not to look so much 
at the symptoms and then treat them, but it's to look at the cause of the symptoms. And you do that in the very, very beginning of the book. You, you begin to say, what are you hearing? What's that voice that you're listening to that will just mm-hmm. say you're not good enough, you're not doing well enough, you will never be who you hope to be because you don't have it in you. I mean, there's, there's something in us that is taunting us in some ways, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, I agree. I think that sometimes it can be, it's one of those things that once you start to notice that critical voice in your head, you spot it all the time. But before you make that connection, before you take that step back and see the why, it seems like what it's telling you is true, right? You hear Mm -hmm. this voice that says, well, you'll never make it or they'll never listen to your idea at work. And you think, yeah, they're never going to listen to me. Who am I? You know, I'm, I'm no one great. And then we, we interact with the world and with people with that belief kind of guiding us. But once we're able to, to recognize, oh, that's that inner critic. And what they're telling me is not necessarily true. And actually probably isn't true if we're being honest, right? Because it's always something negative about ourselves. And once we learn to recognize that and see it as a lie, it's a lot easier then to to take those steps to take better care of ourselves, right? If you're Mm -hmm. thinking, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not good enough. No one, why should I take care of myself? You're not going to take care of yourself, right? Because you don't have that, that why or that rationale. But once you break free of that, those lies that inner inner critic tells you, then you're able to see, you know what, I'm not perfect. There are things I need to work on, but I'm a good person and I have all these good qualities and I have these talents God gave me and God loves me and I am worth taking care of just as much as the person next to me. Mm -hmm. We're talking with Julia Marie Hogan about her book, It's Okay to Start With You. And in the book, what I love about it is that you have the way that it's set up, it's in smaller chapters, but there's a lot of meat in each chapter. So (laughs) at the end, you give reflection questions and also discussion questions. So this could be something that you could do on your own, but it's also something you can do with a group. Or maybe you're a friend of somebody who comes to you and is downloading lots of, of their issues, or maybe it's family members. It helps you to maybe help them break open these moments. Is that, was that your goal, Julia? Yes, yes, exactly right, Chris. I wanted to have the reflection questions were more personal and more looking at what's happening in your own life. And then the discussion questions still go deep, but they are more universal in a sense. Because I know that, you know, some, especially when we're talking about that critical voice, it's something that can be... I mean, you have to be really vulnerable when you're thinking about these things. And that can be uncomfortable to do in a group setting. And so I wanted to make those reflection questions deep and personal. And then the discussion ones, something that you would feel comfortable talking about in a group, but are still going to get you somewhere. They're not fluff questions or they're not, you know, just um, not helpful in any way. So mm-hmm. that's, you know, that was my goal was so that you could make it a personal workshop, a personal journey, or you could bring it into a group setting, like a, a book study or something. Do we realize that we're stressed out? I, I mean, I know that may seem like a, a, a silly question, but for most people I know, they, they loathe to admit they can't handle it, and yet they are demonstrating the classic signs of just becoming so stressed out that they'll crash and burn out. Oh, my goodness, yes. I think for most of us, we don't realize when we're stressed, and... There was an article in the New York Times, and this was many years ago, but it's just so good. I always refer to it, and it was called The Busy Trap. And the author, he talked about how for our culture, being busy is equated with being important. So if we're super busy, then we must be really important, you know? So if people need us, if we're needed, then we're, you know, we have value in the world. And that, but that comes at a cost if we're constantly busy and that's being stressed. But I think that if we see being busy as, as our source of value, our source of importance, then to admit that we can't handle it all feels like a failure. It feels like we're admitting defeat. And so, you know, I talk about in my book a common um, 
a common sort of excuse for not practicing self-care is, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. I don't have time for that, right? I'm better than that. I don't need to take time for myself. I'm not weak. I'm not, you know, um, someone who can't handle things. I've got this. But the reality is, is we're mind and body, and both of those things are not meant to handle sustained stress for long periods of time, right? That Mm -hmm. that turns into burnout, that um, can turn into things like chronic muscle tension, um, digestive issues, and then just anxiety too, right, can can really take a toll on a person. And so we tend to push away those, those signs of stress or we just don't recognize them. We don't realize what it's like to feel relaxed and not to feel on edge all the time or not to feel over-caffeinated or not to, what it's like to not feel sleep-deprived. So practicing self-care is a way of giving yourself that chance to even see what it's like to not be stressed and to not feel those effects on your mind and body. And no one should make the assumption that this is, you know, a, a woman's book. This is, but no way. This is for both men and women because I, all of us, we are challenged by this, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. And I, I have quite a few case examples in my book, and I include examples of both men and women because I think this is an issue that maybe it affects men and women differently, but it's something that, you know, it applies to human beings, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sometimes I know in my particular case, I'll witness to it. Unfortunately, I will be really quick to point out to my husband where he's having the problems. You seem to be getting stressed out about this or is this too much for you? And and yet I won't look at myself. And I think it, as women, because I'm supposed to be wife, mother, but I'm also a, a running a nonprofit or I'm doing this or doing that, that somehow I'm supposed to be superwoman. And mm-hmm. I and I'm, I'm quick to point out what's wrong with the guys, but I'm not so quick to point out what's going on inside of me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it can be hard to you know balance that that pressure or that you know wanting to be there for everyone else and taking time for yourself or taking that time for personal reflection can can feel selfish on the surface. I think it can be misinterpreted that way, right? If I'm taking time for myself or I'm if I'm confronting the things about my own life that I need to change, it can A, be uncomfortable and it can B, seem like I'm taking time away from the other things that I could be doing in my life. Uh, but I think to go back to that oxygen mask analogy, when you take that time away for yourself, you're just, you're kind of filling up the gas tank again, right? Or you're getting mm-hmm. that oxygen that you need so that you can go back out and be better, uh, be a better version of yourself to other people. But I think you make a good point that it can be uncomfortable to take a step back and, you know, really reflect on, on what you're doing and how you're doing in that season of life. And I think that's what I really wanted to address in the self-assessment section of the book where I run through all the different areas of self-care and then ask the reader some true and false questions about how they approach different topics like sleep and body image and uh, stress management. And my goal was to first highlight the areas that the reader was already practicing self-care in. So to say that you're not a total disaster, you know, I'm not here to show you how you're doing all the things wrong. I want to show you what you're doing well because there's something in some area of your life that you're practicing self-care in and you're doing a good job. And then my second goal was to highlight where you might want to focus and make some changes to give you a better sense of direction. And so I think that self-assessment can help can help guide that reflection and make it a little bit easier and less intimidating and scary to really confront, how am I doing? What's taking a temperature check, you know? Uh, The self-assessment section is awesome. Oh, thank you. It really, it just, you don't have to have a lot of different checkpoints, but yours are very pointed, right on target, and if, if it doesn't ping something in all of us, I'd be surprised. You probably are a saint by that point. If, <laughs> if, right? you, if, if you, you read that say. self-assessment and you don't say, oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, um, you know, the big thing about self-care is that it's not about being perfect, Chris. It's not that we have to all follow the same plan. It's really recognizing what do you need in this season of your life. You know, for example, I think the life of, a new mom is very different than someone who is working in the corporate world and working a 80 hour work week. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but they can both practice self care, but it's going to look different for both of them. And so one of the biggest things, 
you know, that I wanted to convey in my book was it's not about being perfect, that it is a continual process. And I mean, I see that in my own life, too. I know I write in my book about, uh, you know, making a really big effort to not skip meals when I'm at work, because sometimes it's tempting to fill my lunch hour slot with another client. Um, but this, these past couple weeks have been really busy for me and I found myself skipping lunch here and there. And I have to remind myself, you wrote about this in the book. You yeah. need to, hold, you know, like, <laughs> you need to practice self care too. So it's, That's uh, right. you know, so just to, just to put it out there that it is a constant, I think recalibrating and reevaluating and holding yourself accountable. And it's not about being perfect by any means. Now you brought up a very, very important point point here in this where you are in the season of your life and you know we've been talking about those people who are very very busy it may have a lot of activities going on are in some ways very self-reliant but we also need to if you're in later years or even elder years that looks different but the concern and the need for self-care is maybe in some cases even more immediate and more important, don't you think? I think so. You know, I think that when you're um, going, you know, you're kind of moving through the stages of life, you're not that your purpose is any different, but I think that you're kind of how you see your place in the world differs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you're older, um, the psychologist Eric Erickson, he talks about your goal when you're in your senior years is that generativity, right? What am I leaving for the next generation? And how am I kind of leaving my legacy or sending good into the world as I, you know, end up my end my time here? And I think, you know, I don't know if this is kind of where you were going, Chris, but I'm just thinking that with self care, you're, you know, you do need to take care of yourself, um, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, all of those things, especially as you get older. But I think also to set an example for the younger generations, because I think that self-care really isn't something that's authentic self-care, I should say, isn't really something that's talked about often in an explicit way. And I think that, you know, as a society, we need to do a better job of communicating that to our children, whether that's in our families or in our schools, um, you know, in, in universities, in the workplace, because, it's such a, it helps us be better and it helps us flourish, but it's not something that's really talked about or learned, right? It's not a skill that's passed down. And so I think that's something that, you know, the, the elder elders in our generation could really, that would be a gift that they could give um, those of us in the younger generations that the importance of self-care and the value of it. Do you know, it, you know, those who have entered into retirement, it, it seems as though they have quote unquote more time on their hands. And so what ends up happening is they fill it with things that end up stressing them out and creating great deal of fear mm -hmm. or, and anxiety or things have changed so much. So whether you're 25 or you're 45 or you're 65 or 70, that getting on social media, watching a lot of television, uh, doing those kind of things, just the world events around you can cause a lot of fear and that too can, as I said before, stress you out. You have to be aware, don't you, if, of yourself, what's going on the side of you, and take care of yourself in that engagement, don't you? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, two things come to mind as you say that. And one is, you know, especially when you're approaching retirement age or you're in the retirement stage, things have really changed for you in the sense that, you know, if, if your kids are grown and now you're an empty nester and if you're retiring from work, the things that maybe provided a significant source of value or meaning to your life look very different and you no longer have your work to kind of define who you are and you no longer have taken care of your kids really to define who you are. Those things have changed in nature and I think that can sometimes leave this feeling of being adrift, right? Mm -hmm. Like, who am I? What is my worth as a person? Because the things that I use to kind of measure my worth are now gone and what do I do? But I think that my second point is that it's just an excellent opportunity then to really look into who am I and accepting myself for who I am, not because of what I do, but because of God's love for me and that he created me, right? Like mm -hmm. 
who you are versus what you do is so important. And, you know, one thing that I talk about in my book is the importance of leisure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's different than sitting down and, and watching TV and, you know, watching 10 episodes of your favorite show or scrolling through social media. It's doing activities that really restore you. And those look different for different people. Like, you know, for some people, reading is very restorative. For some people, going out and playing basketball is really restorative. It just kind of depends. But I think in your retirement years, you have that opportunity to really, really learn the value of leisure and how it can, how it can balance out that work aspect that maybe was, had more of a heavy focus when you were in your working years. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. If you have been blessed in some way by the spiritual nourishment and teachings offered freely by all those involved with Discerning Hearts programs, please consider a positive review for the various programs on the iTunes and Google Play stores. This is a great way to help the ministry and is an encouragement to others who are seeking the best in spiritual formation to find and check out the programs. Won't you please help? It's an easy way to help give back and to be a part of the mission. Thank you, and God bless from all at Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking with Julia Marie Hogan, and her book, It's Okay to Start With You, is phenomenal. And I, I really hope people get it in their hands, because as we have been spoken about a lot of different concepts. Julia has uh, not only given you the why you should take care of yourself to put that oxygen mask on yourself first, but in that self-assessment, as we mentioned before, is so practical. But then in as you've gone through the self-assessment and the areas have need, and to be honest with everybody, I found need in each of those areas. <laughs> and what I was so glad to have was then you go in to the different sections and you help with an action plan, something that you can, I don't mean to sound so, so clinical, but I mean, it's a way of entering into each of those. How would you describe them? The action plan that I put together, I go through each section of self-care. So I go through physical self-care, emotional, mental relationship, and spiritual, and I, I kind of give different ideas for how to practice self-care in that area, guide you through some reflection questions within that section too. And then the idea is to start with something really small because a lot of research shows that when we take small, concrete, easily defined steps, we're more likely to be successful at sustaining them long term. You know, so for example, if you know, if my goal is to exercise more, if I say, okay, well, I haven't been to the gym in three months, but I'm going to run five miles tomorrow on the treadmill, I'm going to be really sore the next day and I'm going to feel discouraged and I'm going to think, oh, I can never do this. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not going to go back to the gym. 
But if I say, okay, I haven't been to the gym in three months, I want to run a 5K in, say, six months, I'm going to go to the gym on the treadmill and do maybe just a slow jog and then a walk and then a slow jog and a walk. And I'm going to do that for 20 minutes and I'm not going to worry about the length or the speed or anything. And then I'll just keep increasing slowly. That is much more sustainable because you are showing yourself that you can do it. You're pushing yourself a little bit, but not too much where it's discouraging but you're still getting that sense of accomplishment like you're moving forward. And so in the book, I offer some concrete suggestions for how to do that, how to find those small goals and find the ones that make the most sense to you, and then how to define it so that you know exactly what you need to do to make that happen. My, um, you know, my goal was that I know that, I mean, we live busy lives. That's the reality of our modern world. And so I didn't want a reader to read through my book and then think, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get any of this done? There's no way I can do it. And so by helping you identify those small steps you can take, my goal is to help you see that self-care is something that you can incorporate even when your life is busy. And you know, most importantly, when your life is busy so that you can still experience the benefits of self-care, but not feel like you need to go off to a seven-day mountain retreat alone, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Again, I... I... I think this book is so important because it is steeped all throughout with a Catholic Christian worldview because the ultimate goal is holiness, wholeness, completeness. I mean, if you're going to serve and do God's will, you have to be that temple has to be one that he can operate in the one the way he's designed you. That's the ultimate goal. By taking care of you, you become who he has need of you to be. Would you say that's correct, Julia? Yes, I would agree completely. And I think that that is, you know, at the beginning of our discussion, Chris, I was talking about authentic self-care versus just more maybe pop culture self-care. And I think that that authentic self-care can only have that meaning or that authenticity when we relate it back to God and and why he created us and and that he loves us and I think that's the value of having that Christian Catholic worldview incorporated into the book and I think that's what makes it unique there's nothing else out there that tackles this topic in this way and so I think it when you you know when your faith is important to you Reading a book that acknowledges your faith and shows you how your faith informs the practice of self-care, I think, is really important because then you, it's easier to understand the why, right? You know, mm-hmm. if it's just, oh, well, you'll feel better if you do this, or it's good for you to do, you know, it's, we all know there are lots of things that are good for us to do, right? But if we can understand how our faith can motivate us and drive us forward and is the foundation for self-care, it just makes a lot more sense. Well, Julia, I have you gotten the sense that I really like this book? I, I think so. <laughs> I, re- I really do. Well, I you know, and I'm so glad. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad, and I just thank our Cindy visitor for putting it together the way that they did, and you allowing it to come forward the way that it is, because I think it's very practical, but it it addresses a very important need. And it can be used in so many different settings, as we said earlier. It can be used not only by individuals, it can be used by friends. In, in, imagine a husband and wife sitting down and going through this, mm-hmm. or larger groups. It's great for those type of studies. I hope you've gotten a lot of, of really good feedback so far from what you put forward here. I have, and I have to tell you, Chris, it's just so humbling because my little joke is that I sometimes feel that I wrote a really long research paper and just turned it in and to never see it again. You know, mm-hmm. like these are the things I feel passionate about and this is what I wrote. Um, and, you know, my editor was amazing. So she really helped make this book what it is. But to hear from people, you know, that I've never met before or, you know, someone told me um, – one of my friends, her sister told me that she met some people at a church in a different state and they were using my book for a book club study. And that was just so humbling. And just, I was so grateful that people out there finding that the message is resonating with them because, you know, I see it in, you know, in my life and in my friendships and my relationships, but also in my work with my clients. And I just see the need for self-care 
And so to hear that other people are saying, this is helping me and this is valuable and this is resonating with me is just, you know, I'm like, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for, you know, inspiring me to write this book and then for getting it into the hands of the people who will benefit from it most. Well, that's beautiful, Julia. And I, I'm going to just be a new good friend for you. I oh, would thank you. recommend this book to you because as your life is changing, you probably will have to go back and do another self-assessment. <laughs> I probably will. And sometimes I find myself flipping through my book and saying, oh, yeah, that is a good idea. I should keep doing that, right? <laughs> that's right. I mean, I think that's what you, it, this is not one of those things where you just, okay, oh, I did that, just did this program. All right, put it down. Next, what's the next thing? Now, right. this is how you are transforming and entering into a way of living, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, I agree. I think like I said before, you know, the fact that it's this continual process of recalibrating and reevaluating is just seeing what do I need right now? Because, you know, I think just quickly, uh, different seasons of our life require a focus on different areas of self-care. So, for example, if we're going through a really stressful time, maybe focusing on mental self-care is important, whereas maybe, I mean, it's hard to pick one and say one is the most important because it's not, um, you know, but maybe maybe you're going through a really tough time and spiritual self-care is where you need to direct most of your energy. So I think it really is just, you know, recognizing what do I need right now? What's best for me to help me be, you know, be the best version of the person that God has called me to be? As you're speaking, more and more of those scenarios come up in my head. I mean, th those who may be going through an unexpected grief. Mm -hmm. Not only the loss of a loved one, it, maybe it could be even a loss of a job or any type of loss that leaves you empty. It, once again, you need to go back and take a look at where does the divine physician need to get in there and help mm -hmm. you to be able to be brought back to that wholeness again. Oh, yeah, I agree. I think that you know, that's the time when you're going through some kind of grief or a loss where, I mean, you feel like the rug has been pulled out from under your feet and you feel at a loss. And I think that practicing the discipline of self-care can be a way of just, you know, almost like nurturing yourself and taking care of yourself through that tough time. And, you know, you don't need to make any drastic changes, but just reminding yourself that you need to get enough sleep, that you need to still be eating that you need to be talking to someone about your, what you're going through, that you need to keep the prayer life going even if you feel mad at God for what happened. And I think it's that self-care can kind of guide you through, okay, I'm at a loss, I don't know what to do, but I know I can at least take care of myself until I kind of figure things out. And you're not being selfish. Right. No, I mean, I think when you think, when you think about the oxygen mask analogy or when you see self-care as that external sign of knowing God's love for you, um, you know, if God loves me for as I am right now with my imperfections and everything, and he's not saying all of you and you're perfect. He's saying, I love you right now. And I think if we truly recognize that, I think we would be just glowing, right? And mm -hmm. I think we would see, no, I need to get enough sleep so that I am ready for the next day so that I can, I can do what God called me to do so that I can be the best instrument for what he wants me to do in the world. Or I know I need to get enough, um, you know, proper nutrition, or I know that I need to be managing stress because if I'm at my best, then God can use me in the best way. Oh, Julia, this is a, a fantastic work. And I wish we had more time. Any final thoughts? Um, you know, I think the most important thing that maybe to take away is it doesn't have to be an overwhelming task to practice self-care. And it doesn't need to be intimidating. And it's not something that is only for people who have some sort of special talent for it. It's something that we all need and something we can all do. And my hope is that my book was able to translate that in just a digestible, uh, easy to implement way. Keep writing those research papers, will you? <laughs> I, will. I will. And submitting them. I mean, please. <laughs> submitting them into the universe, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Keep doing that because the universe is uh, benefiting from it tremendously. Mm -hmm. And it Thank just follow so the prompting much. of the Holy Spirit. And again, Thank you so much. With Julia Marie Hogan, we've gone inside the pages of It's Okay to Start With You. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to osv.com, the website for its publisher, Our Sunday Visitor. 
or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. You also can visit Julia's website at juliamariehogan.com. To hear and or to download this conversation along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling author.